Welcome to the Hawkcast with your host, AJ Hawk. All right, right now we have Monty Ball joining us on the show. Monty, uh, you've been, um, actually, first off, before I even go anywhere else, would you, how do you like people to pronounce your name? Monty? Monty? How does it go? <laughs> I'm never sure. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, pronounced Monte. Monte? Yes, it is. Yep. So I've been, I've been getting up and wrong forever. No, it doesn't matter. I, I always tell people tomato, tomato. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Get the point across. <laughs> Man, okay. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad we, we cleared it up before I went through like an hour and, and you would hopefully would have uh, interrupted me and let me know that I was way off base. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's <laughs> all right. Problem. So uh, actually, well, I obviously I've, I've known about your, your football career for a long time. And I think a lot of people have watched you through the years at Wisconsin, your time in Denver. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then recently, you uh, you were real open and honest with a guy uh, named Alex Marvez, who I've co-hosted a few times on Sirius XM with, and he's just nice. uh, he's a great guy. How did you? Before we even get into that whole article, like what what made you make the decision to to trust Alex for to for him to write that piece? Right. So um, I uh, we both have a mutual friend. Um, so my marketing team is based out of LA, um, inclusive. And the head guy working there kind of took off, and now he's working for uh, Gary Gary Vaynerchuk in VaynerMedia, Vayner Sports. And so um, he been I've been in contact with him, and we've been talking and all that stuff. And he kind of knew the path that I was finally getting on, and knew what type of project I wanted to work on. So he connected me actually with Alex, and then I briefly spoke with Alex and kind of uh, got the sense that he. You know, he felt like a trustworthy guy that he was going to actually tell the story I wanted it to be told. And uh, and that's exactly what he did. Now, what exactly is that story that you wanted out there? Could you describe to people that maybe yeah. don't know how um, the alcohol kind mm-hmm. of derailed uh, your, your football plan and, and pretty much yeah. it touched all aspects of your life? Yeah, I mean, it's just it just goes on and on about um, – you know what a lot of people don't understand what a lot of football players are actually going through um just a lot of pressure you know living in this fishbowl and a lot of expectations that need to be matched and uh criticism being criticized each and every single day so i kind of fell into a trap of uh kind of self-medicating um, in a sense and you know that just led me down a you know very destructive path um that uh, you know didn't work out too well for me and you know i wasn't trying to play the whole what was me card and and kind of push some of the blame off of what I've done. Um, but I think that's a very important topic that I wanted to kind of explain, kind of just uh, kind of empty out the closet in a sense. <laughs> How did it feel after the uh, that article was posted? Did it feel like, was it a, re- a relief or what? <sighs> yeah, man. I feel like there's a lot of, a lot of relief, a lot of, you know, just pressure lifted off my shoulders um, because it's, um, it's, it's, it's an issue that's, you know, really heavy in my family. My father's a recovering alcoholic. My brother-in-law's a recovering alcoholic. His father's a recovering alcoholic. Um, all of my my dad's dad to his dad and so on were alcoholics. So it's just something that I'm willing and, and I'm ready to break the chain, break this cycle because uh, it's it's really taken our family down. So how, growing up, when did your dad, I guess, uh, enter treatment or, or begin to get sober? Yeah, so I've never seen my dad drunk. My dad's been sober, recovering alcoholic since age 22. He's now 45. Um, He's had a few lapses, um, but uh, my mother did a great job of kind of shielding that away from us, putting the cloak over our eyes because we didn't really see it. We may have saw it, but we didn't know what was happening when we were little. Um, But he uh, he actually now is currently still receiving counseling for it and uh, understanding that it's a lifelong lesson or lifelong journey and been kind of it's been rewarding in a sense that he understands that you know we're all in this together was it ever something that he saw maybe while you were in college did he ever warn you about uh what could happen and that this was something that ran in your family uh so my relationship with my father he's not really much of a talker not much of an emotional guy uh you know my mother kind of took that role he was kind of the handyman all you know all my life growing up but uh you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. He did recently tell me that he did see me going down that path, but it was so hard for him to say anything because he was kind of looking at himself in a way. Um, and 
you know, I kind of wish she would have said something, but I, I can kind of sense how difficult that would have been for a parent to see their son doing the same exact stuff that they were doing. So he, he really leaned on my mother to kind of talk to me and stuff. And I had millions of conversations with my mom about uh, my habits. So like when you were in college, like, did you realize that you, this was potentially an issue or that you had maybe a problem? Um, <clears throat> my junior year, my junior year in college, uh, which, you know, surprisingly was, was my best season. It was with, uh, with Russell when Russell Wilson was the quarterback. Um, and, uh, we played extremely well on the field, but um, I was more focused on the nightlife. I was more focused on what was to come after a win, um, where where we were going to party and stuff like that. So I kind of started to notice it becoming a problem, not just because of me actually physically doing the drinking, but how much I thought about it. It started to really uh, flood my, my brain. Well, that's got to be a, a tough thing because in college, even athletes, no matter what sport you play, that's kind of normal. That's kind of normal behavior for people to, to want to understand. Like on the fourth quarter of a, of a game, say you're playing at, at Camp Randall and the place is going crazy and you guys are blowing them out. Every guys are walking up and down the sides like, yeah, man, where are you going tonight? And you talk about where you're going to go that <laughs> night and how great the party is going to be. So that's not yeah. that unusual. So mm -hmm. it's almost like you could you could fit in or maybe sneak sneak that. And if you did have problems, it's, it's going to kind of go unnoticed. Did your coaches or anybody ever think anything? Uh, my running back coach did my junior year and senior year running back coach. Uh, he's now the running back coach for the Baltimore Ravens. And he uh, he noticed one practice that I smelled like alcohol because um, the previous night I went out. And, uh, and obviously I smelled like it the next morning. Uh, it was just, you know, I had a long conversation. Sorry, a long conversation actually yesterday about this uh, with somebody. It's because he kind of mentioned the same stuff that you just mentioned, but it goes even deeper with that, with, you know, the chemical imbalances that people have in their mind, because right now you can say that, you know, I've partied with hundreds of football players drinking just as much as me, partying just as much as me, but I couldn't handle it. I could handle it because of the way that what it did to my brain and how it's hereditary and how my father acted with alcohol is kind of passed down to, to myself. So it's, it's common, but my goal is to kind of preach to college students that just pay attention to what habits that you're creating. Like pay attention to that habit. Yeah, so that, man, that's crazy. So your junior year, you started to notice of how, I guess, how you felt about it. Uh, would you want, would you wake up wanting to drink? Is it one of those things where like, you're shaking, you have to drink to even out? No, honestly, no, no. And that's what I'm still in the process of kind of, you know, figuring that out is more of a social drinker. But my thing is I uh, really struggle, struggled with uh, social anxiety, um, being in big groups, uh, constantly talking about football, constantly talking about, you know, everything and all that stuff. So I used alcohol as a social lubricant. It would calm me down. And then I was able to, you know, talk about anything and kind of blend in. So I, that's why I was such a, I was more of a social drinker. I'd hurry up and drink and drink and drink just so I can calm down and be able to, you know, socially interact with others. Was that ever an issue? I know coming out, so you're a second round pick to the Denver Broncos. Mm -hmm. That's something that they do their homework on all their draft picks. Did you get any indication at the combine or from any scouts that people were worried about your drinking? Um, no, honestly, no. Um, no, because I didn't really talk about it. I didn't really have major issues in college uh, other than you know I was cited I was arrested on Mifflin Street block party I was cited for trespassing but um, what happened I was standing on someone's porch so yeah. it's Mifflin Street it's they have to the houses have to register in order to have parties and I was standing with a group of people on a porch that didn't register for a party so we were all cited arrested and cited um but no, a lot of teams didn't know about the issue because I didn't speak about it in college, and um, I just played football, and then I kind of hid under a rock and, and drank. Did you have like, did you have one or two really close friends that that had an idea or that you could confide in? Uh, no, not in college. No, not in college because it was just strictly football. And then um, I was fortunate enough to have my family move up to Wisconsin my freshman year. Um, so I talked a lot with my mother and she kind of knew she kind of saw it early on because of how frequent I would drink. I mean, it was every single weekend until I blacked out and, uh, and I talked about it a lot. Did you miss it? Did you, uh, like, 
was it becoming a thing where you'd be late to meetings or were you able to uh, to kind of hide it that way? No, still able to hide it um, because it wasn't as bad then. I mean, it was don't get me wrong, it was bad, but it, it increased once I got into the NFL. Because um, in college, it was still school. It was still, obviously, it was still football, but it was still I, I would go home and hang out with my family. There were still other things that I was able to do without drinking. Um, it just escalated quickly once I got into the NFL because money, um, it became more accessible. Um, and, uh, you, it brings going into the NFL, like, you know, uh, there's a, there's a group, there's a crowd that will love to follow you, um, because of what you can provide for them. Did you have a bunch of hanger honors once you got to Denver? Oh yeah, man. Um, I only speak with, you know, other than my girlfriend. So my, my girlfriend, so right now I'm back in Wisconsin, my girlfriend and my son live in Denver right now. Um, I'm back here to finish up my degree. Um, it starts in June. Um, but I only speak other than them and her family. I only speak with one other person in Denver. Uh, really? Were yeah. most of these, were most of those guys that were hanging out, were they Denver people or they were, or were they guys like from high school that came out? Like how who was it? Okay. Yeah. Den- Denver, they were Denver people. And, uh, cause once I was drafted, it was big news and then they all kind of jumped on the, the old bandwagon. And then I, I, you know, I, recovering alcoholic now but at the time i was an alcoholic and i just went along with it and surrounded myself around bad people and did they live with you no 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 they did not live with me uh it was it was just a time of i remember a lot of players would say you know i never had my front door locked you know they would just walk right in and they were like why aren't your door locked and i'm like uh and i'd always be having I'd always have parties and stuff like that. So it was a lack of focus, honestly. And that showed, you know, on the field, uh, you know, because I did great things in college and then I really didn't show much in the NFL because it, it, I wanted to drink and party. Yeah. You're, I think I, I maybe in that a piece that Alex wrote, what, what days you, when you were playing the NFL, you said you drank what days again? So it would be obviously if the game was Sunday night or Sunday game, obviously that night, um, going on mondays for you know review you know it's easy little lift and then i'll drink monday evening and night um no, afternoon and night and then uh tuesday's off day wednesday's practice wouldn't drink um drink i'll drink on thursdays because you know knowing that friday is an easy practice and then also drink on friday knowing that saturday is just an easy walkthrough you know, for practice or for the game on Sunday. Was it always just drinking or did you get into other stuff? No, uh, just drinking. Yeah, it was just alcohol. Um, being in Denver, it's such a <laughs> – Yeah. Well, yeah, I love the city. I do I do, I do, do love the city, but, uh, you know, by them legalizing marijuana, the Colorado legalizing it, it's, there's a lot of other drugs floating around um, all the time. Yeah, what do you think? Do you, do you have an opinion on what the NFL should do about that with, like, Colorado, California? Like, it's recreational – I'm Washington. Do you think the NFL should should just stop testing for weed and let guys smoke? Hey man, yeah, man, that's such a sensitive topic. Um, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want people to think that I I, I smoke marijuana because I don't. I don't want people to think that I'm against people who smoke marijuana because, um, I, I there's a lot of studies that show that it's it helps it helps for people who actually need it. Um, my take on it is if it's used for recreational, then you shouldn't be using it. Um, should use it if you actually need it, if it's medically descri- uh, prescribed. And as for the NFL, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't really know if I want to touch much on that. No, you're good, man. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, <laughs> I think it's crazy. I mean, you know how it works to where either they're tested. You're tested once a year for street drugs, and if you fail, then you get put in the program. You're, it's not made public, basically, I think, till your third positive test where you're suspended. Mm-hmm. So right. if you if guys want to smoke, they can smoke. You just stop a month or so before the, the initial test time because you know the window they can test for that too. Mm-hmm. But so it's like if you're getting busted, if you're getting suspended for smoking weed, you got busted multiple times, not just once. So true. Yeah. They, they, yeah. My thing is, I mean, it's – if they really wanted to stop it, they would test more for it. Yeah. They'd test like they do for steroids anytime, exactly. anywhere. So, exactly. So yeah, it's it's like hey, it's a wink and a nod. Like hey, man, we're, we got to test you just so we can <laughs> say we test you, but that's about it. Yeah, I mean it would it would it's put it this way, and not just speaking for the Broncos, uh, just other players I knew in the league and 
speaking about their teammates, it's, it's common. Yeah, in it's, all of pro sports, not just football. <laughs> I mean, it's it's exactly. more common in other sports for sure. Yeah, yeah, man. So that's like yeah, that's a thing they're always talking about. What, what's Roger Goodell going to do? Who knows? It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me really. But uh, <laughs> it was whatever. If like I said, if if what you're doing at home doesn't affect me or doesn't put my my family in, in harm, you can do whatever you want, man. I'm I'm good. I'm okay yeah. with it. What right. about like when it comes to that? <laughs> did you did you ever make say you did you ever make poor decisions like where you get behind the wheel and drive? Um, it never got to that point. I never got to that point because of Uber. And also I had an Uber driver who lived, I think he lived two miles from my house. So what he would do is he would just shut off his Uber app and then I would just text him and he would just drive me and my friends around for like four or five hours of the night. Um, because I would tell him, like, I would just pay you X amount if you did this. And he'd be like, why not? So he shuts his Uber off and he's like our personal driver for the night. Uh, yeah, I was never one to drink and drive because there's really no reason to. <laughs> yeah, especially really Uber changed the game with that. Yeah, there yeah you shouldn't. I mean, there's no excuse. I didn't at the time. I didn't want to park my car and, and do all that. I'd rather just get out and walk right in. Yeah, so. that's I, that's why I think now there's there's definitely no excuse. If, you, if you're going a mile, it's, it's just get an Uber. Pay, pay yeah, three just, bucks to get an Uber. Don't drive your car. And it's so easy to push a button, literally. <laughs> so that, yeah, no, no, none of us really did that because there's no reason, especially if you have money and not that far from downtown, just uh, just Uber. <laughs> yeah, man. When when you got to Denver, when you were drafted, like you said, high draft pick, second round, what was the culture like when you walked into that locker room? Like, what, what was the dynamic between, like, vets and young guys? Was it a, a good culture they had already? It really was. It really, really was because uh, – you know, Payton did some great things. He came in um, and changed up some stuff and, you know, increased everyone's attention in a sense, you know, on the field, most definitely in the classroom and within the playbooks. But the feel of Denver, man, in the locker room was literally family style. Uh, and it shows on the field. Um, everyone jokes, everyone was joking around in the locker room, having a good time. My locker was um, two lockers from Peyton, so we talked all the time. And uh, kind of exactly what you would think it think it you know is because of how well denver has been playing um they 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 literally act like a family in the locker room and treat each other with respect and that's exactly how it was and i'm not just saying that because i'm being super honest yeah did they so when people talk about learning the offense that whatever offense peyton is running all the checks is it as as serious as they make it to where it's so difficult to figure out (laughs) because peyton wants to change the the play nine times at the line or he wants to give dummy calls at the line of scrimmage (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right it's 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 easy for the players no i wouldn't say easy it's it's a bit challenging because you never know what he's thinking but obviously with all the practice and stuff like that you kind of get a feel for what he's going to say what he's looking at but um i can see how it's very difficult for other teams because it's like what is he saying should we focus on what he's saying because it can be dummy calls is he actually saying something so but the great thing that peyton did was peyton would actually work with you he would work with the entire offense with play calls, with signals. We'd have individual meetings with signals, team uh, settings with signals. And he really took a lot of pride in that stuff. So for practice squad players, like they would have to exit the room really? when, we do, when we do signals because you know how it goes. You don't know if they'll you know, be gone in two weeks or something like that. So he was v- very protective of even his call sheet, his signal sheet. He would not little loose leaf piece of paper he wouldn't hand it to anyone <laughs> so would he change the signals up throughout the year yeah he would change the signals about every six weeks um every six to eight weeks changes the signals um or includes dummy signals um honestly he just he, he just he's a, he's an artist literally he's an artist you know he, is that, that's something that i've talked with uh <clears throat> I've had my buddy Aaron Rodgers on here a few times, and mm-hmm. he he hates all the microphones on the field. You know how yes. like the center's mic, the the uh, the ref, and he just said it is true. If you watch a TV copy of a game, you can hear everything. And you were on the team, I think, when Peyton made the whole Omaha deal famous, mm-hmm. right? And when everyone hear Omaha, Omaha, and for, wasn't that what just his last like it's it's coming on your first sound after Omaha? Wasn't that what it was? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Eli used it too. That's why I don't get why it was like all of a sudden blew up. I'm like. They've been doing this forever, man. Like it's not yeah, new. It's, it's funny. So I 
all the players on other teams, like just like yourself, they knew what yeah. it was. But the fans and the media, they were trying to decipher what it was. It's like mm. it's first sound. Like <laughs> yeah. so I mean, but the great thing about that, what he did was is, you know, he'll do a dummy call, he'll call a dummy call in the huddle and say Omaha's a dumb dummy call. So it's you know, so it, it can go either way, but uh he did complain too about the uh microphones on the field. Um, it, it does, yeah. It does give a – for the offense, it gives – it puts them – which offense, I mean, be real. Everyone wants to see them score points. I'm a fan of football mm -hmm. as well, so I want to see them score points. Right. I understand why it's kind of slanted the rules are for that. But I guess it does give this it, – it's something my last couple of years I played, I was surprised – not surprised, but we would watch sometimes – we'd have segments of meetings where we would watch the TV copy with volume and just to hear some of their signals. Yeah. yeah. So that's a big thing that the offenses were never doing before. Like defense couldn't do that before, but now you mm -hmm, can. No. no, that's what he said. He said now teams are snatching TV copies and literally yeah. doing film study from TV copies because you can hear everything. You can, so you have to work. It just another, adds another element. But that was like uh, that's a thing to watch where when you're watching the, the Broncos play or you're playing against when Peyton's playing. He, it's – do you guys – how do you even begin to install that kind of offense to where mm -hmm. there's so many checks – or there's just so many things that could happen once you get to the line of scrimmage? Like, where does it even begin? <laughs> uh, that, yeah, you got me thinking. Now, how, how would we start? We would start it out with uh, – my gosh, man. He – like, I mean, it showed on the field. He took so much pride. So, he had a – he had a package. Man, he had a top gun package that he called it, which was, you know, one side – um, was a bunch of, you know, was a bunch of calls and the right side was a bunch of calls too, but they can also blend in together too. And he had another package called the, uh, value menu, huh. the, the big, little and big, I think it was, or small and small and big, which was like strong and weak, um, in a sense. So he, he would start out with those packages and which that was just like hurry up offense, hurry up offense and all that stuff. And then within that, he would, he would then do meetings with his play calls or sorry, meetings with his signals. And kind of tell us when he is likely to change that signal to kind of he would so what do you do is just kind of teach us what he's looking at mm -hmm. in a sense and honestly to be as frank as possible man it's you really never knew when he was going to change it because mm -hmm. because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean it was Peyton Manning he 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 saw stuff you know for years and years and years and as a rookie you didn't really know what he was looking at or anything along those lines so you just made sure just to know the words and study the playbook now in those when he would run those meetings would that be like the 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 whole offense is in the room or would he come individually into your rooms so you know we'd have team meeting defense leaves they go to a separate room and uh we'll go over you know the package that's installed for you know this upcoming team and they will explain why we're using these certain plays against these certain players and stuff and then he would then get up. So after the, the OC sits down, the offensive coordinator, he would then get up and go over the signals. Again, there would be like – so that he'll bring like 30 signals uh, to a game, and everyone had to study him. Wide receivers, running backs, tight ends, even the O-line would have to know, obviously, um, where to turn if it's a five, six-man protection, et cetera, based on, you know, just simple words. So would you would he sit there and just give the signals and all of you at the same time say him back or is he like individually quizzing guys? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes he'll individually quiz you. Sorry, I didn't miss that. I missed that. He would at first he would start out with he'll just throw a signal up and then would say it, throw another one up, say it, then he'll call a name. And uh <laughs> and the guy gets nervous then. <laughs> yeah, I remember one time I was like leaning back in my chair and you know, he called me. It's so like I sat up and <laughs> And uh, it took me a while to get it, but I got it because my running back coach sat next to me and kind of nudged me and whispered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, he, he would he would he he would quiz players um, in front of the coach, so it was a all day learning experience <laughs> that keeps you locked in. Yeah, it sucks. Those are like anxiety ridden <laughs> meetings. I know we would do that a lot of times in Green Bay, to where we go over our defensive signals, and each week. <laughs> We, I think we might be doing on Wednesdays or Thursdays. We mm -hmm. you have to go through the whole list, and you know, he'd call – coordinator Dom Capers would call a new player up every week to stand in front of the defense, and Dom would just stand there and say, okay, and he would he would give our calls, and then you had to give the signals. 
And man, <laughs> guys would get so nervous for their time. They'd be, they'd, they'd have like their buddies quiz them in the hallway outside the yeah. bathroom right before. Like nothing. For some reason, guys lose their mind and freak out when they get caught up and they have to do it. <laughs> and it's a, it's a funny thing because your teammates. That's the thing you want to be accountable to your teammates and your coaches. Mm -hmm. And if you start, even if you're like, when we would be doing our signals, even if you delayed for a second, the whole room starts booing you and yelling and stuff. So it's a, it's a tough deal, man. <laughs> they do the same thing. They would crumble up. <laughs> so players would already have, you know, crumbled up paper balls. As soon as you hesitated for longer than three, four seconds, they just chuck them at you. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine too, if Peyton came to a guy, say after the meeting and said, Hey man, you really, uh, you really need to, we really need to get in your book and learn those signals. I can imagine it would be like a, a disappointed dad coming down on you. <laughs> you sounded just like him right there. <laughs> no, that's it's funny that you said that you use that because I, I told other people that. I was like, uh, you know, on the field, Peyton's Peyton. Everyone knows how Peyton is on the field. He's very strict. He's, you know, he, and that's, you know, good for him. That's why he's a Hall of Famer, um, future Hall of Famer. But it's off the field he was a jokester but it was still kind of hard to relate because obviously the age gap but then again it was like you know he had some kind of old corny jokes and then, <laughs> and then he's sitting there with his tight jeans on and buttoned up shirt tucked in and and everything so it was kind of like a dad figure in a sense yeah. really good man really good man no question that's the thing when as you get older like peyton's doing movie lines from like Top Gun. I'm like, and half you guys, you guys weren't born when Top Gun came out. You have no idea what he's right. talking about. So, and Peyton probably he's he probably goes back farther than Top Gun, given movies oh, from yeah. the early '80s. Oh yeah, yeah he yeah he had some jokes that I kind of just laughed at. Just uh, I didn't really understand him, but I was like, oh yeah yeah yeah. And then really didn't know what was going on. That is funny. So you're that yeah, your your was your rookie year his first year in Denver. Uh, uh no. Um, so my rookie year was 2013. I think his first year was 2012. Okay. Yeah, because 2011, I think was Tebow. Uh, I think. Then 2012 was Peyton. I'm not sure. Uh, I think he was there for a year though when I when I showed up. Okay, and then your head coach for your whole time was Gary Kubiak. Um no, uh Fox. Oh, you Fox, were you Fox. weren't no Fox in the transition to Kubiak. Man, my timeline is way off. Time flies, <laughs> okay. man. Yeah, he's in Chicago now. Yeah, he was my coach, Foxy. And then um, he was my coach my first and second year. Yeah. Okay. And then my third year. So I didn't even get an opportunity to play with Gary. I was released uh, right after camp. Okay. So That's the thing. Okay, so they, they made that transition. That's why I didn't understand. Was Kubiak the offensive coordinator under John Fox? Uh, No. Um, Kubiak was the – OC or the quarterbacks coach. I think it was the OC back back in the, no, he was back up for Elway. Um I see I, I, I can't my time was mixed up too, but the OC for Fox is now the head coach for the Dolphins, Gase. Oh yeah, okay. Gase. Yeah. He was the OC uh for for my two years there. And then the third year we we got somebody else I can't I can't remember right now. Somebody new. Man, it's crazy to think John Fox left and then Kubiak's first year they won the Super Bowl. Yeah. With Fox. Yeah. Like, what was the culture like with Fox? I've, I've only heard great things from guys yeah. that have played for him. <laughs> Honestly, Fox, Foxy is a down to earth jokester, even on the field during <laughs> practice. Gets serious when, when, obviously, when it needs to be, but he was very relatable, easy to talk to, um, down to earth guy. Uh, I had no issues with him at all. And I, all the players, I never heard anyone say anything bad about Foxy, which I'm sure it's easy to coach when, uh, when yeah, when you're going 13 and three on average, you know, every year. But uh, I had no issues with him at all, seriously. Yeah, he uh, he's a highly respect. I mean, he's got to find a way to win in Chicago, which who knows, man. At the right, time yeah. of us when we're recording this, the draft's about to happen, mm -hmm. so we'll see what happens. But do, how much how much attention do you pay to to NFL football right now? Not a lot, man. Not a lot, and there's some other players too that uh, I've kind of been talking to. Um, I'll actually be with him tonight. Uh, that don't really watch much of it. So Chris Borland. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, we we we're gonna hang out tonight. I'm gonna see him, and uh, it's it's kind of this overall. You know, the group of people that I hang out with, um, they we really don't watch a lot of football because I'll catch it if I know a big game's coming on. I'll, I'll watch it, but um, I do a lot more golfing now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you always do that, or that is that no. recent? 
seriously something new and I have a much I have a greater respect for it because I've actually been trying to play it and I'm like now watching these athletes do it on on TV it's like they're not only making contact which sometimes I struggle with <laughs> you know they're putting it exactly where it should be <laughs> so so yeah to answer your question man I'll catch a game um I still love the game of course but uh you know I'm ready to branch off and do other things what are those other things like what what would that be what's it look like yeah yeah, becoming an advocate, man, for, you know, mental, you know, wellness, um, addiction, awareness, kind of ending the stigma that comes along with <clears throat> being an addict. Um, because I believe if I'm able to break down that barrier, um, that, you know, the, that, that the stigma that it creates, which is judgment, guilt, and, and shame, you know, people will be more apt to speaking about their problems and receiving help. So kind of branching off into the public speaking world, I had an event um Tuesday night, um, I went and spoke at an addiction center and it went extremely well. That'd that'd be awesome, man. You have a great story. That's I like to do. I just had a few speaking gigs and I I want to get yeah. more into it. But you're right, especially when you're you're open and honest, as you said when you first started. We started talking like you just kind of mm -hmm. emptying out your closet with with Alex Marvez and that piece. People can relate, man, because everyone, no one wants to stand up there and listen to a guy that's the the holier than thou dude that's done right. nothing wrong in his life and everything Cookie is so. Cutter. Yeah, I'm like, bro, that's not that's not reality. You're not. Mm -mm. It's like why a lot of times politicians fall hard because they want to prop themselves up like this is me, like oh, everything's perfect, and then their life comes crumbling down yeah. when any one thing happens. That's kind of what I explained to the group is because you know they were still kind of, and I told them it's extremely humbling that they're still saying those great things about me after everything they were praising me for what I did at Wisconsin and stuff. And I, you know, I continued to thank them, but I also told them like, you know, strip me of football. Then who am I? I'm the same exact person that you guys are. Someone who dealt with depression, anxiety, and self-medicated medic medicated with a drug. Um, and which, you know, ultimately, you know, kind of ended my career, but uh, there's a silver lining in it. I believe that I'm on path right now to actually find a better passion. Do you think when you when you talk about self medicating, I, that's mm -hmm. interesting to me. So, um, <laughs> I know I saw where you went and had a, a workout or a tryout with the Packers. Yeah, and it said was it you were overweight when you showed up? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think was that was how well, how much? Do you think uh, four or five pounds? I was I think I weighed in at two thirty four, two thirty or two thirty four. I think it was. They wanted me at about like between 225 230 so i think i was about 230 yeah somewhere in there did you know that you were you were overweight uh, oh, oh of course yeah yeah of course because once i was released by denver uh, i kind of you know really increased my drinking because i had a lot of time on my you know free time and just put on some bad weight and then was like oh wait i gotta try out uh let me go do this tryout was that a form do you think like letting yourself go a little bit or drinking like is that a form of like self-sabotage where if you give yourself like a built-in excuse you could kind of tell you that hey like i wasn't really trying for that anyway or i came in overweight i know that people that happens all over the place kind of self-sabotage in a way just to not go play i guess like if you if you sense. don't if you never truly step out there or give it your all then you kind of in the back of your mind can have a, a feeling like hey well i i could i could have definitely made it but i kind of uh, just i was messing around i, I wasn't really working i wasn't doing but if i want to if i put my mind to it i'll, I'll i can make a team that's what you're saying that's kind of yeah that's kind of how it was uh the mindset that i had uh because once i came back i really started hanging out with a group of people who uh who are not good people um and you know i started drinking a lot and you know, I was always telling people, oh, yeah, 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 I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back in the league. It's, it's going to be fine. And then the tryout came along, and I knew I wasn't going to perform well, but uh, I had that in the back of my mind. Like, oh, if I would have practiced and actually trained, you know, I'd have been able to make it so I can do it again with another team. I think a lot of people are, are guilty of that, and I've been, <laughs> yeah. I've been guilty of that on different, like, different activities. Like, say, I don't know, like I'm terrible at math in school. And I would, I knew I was going to be horrible. I knew I was going to get a bad grade on the test. But if I, so I'd be like, well, I'm not even going to try to work on it. I could maybe study a little bit, get some help, see a tutor, and maybe get a C plus. But I wouldn't even do that. And I would go in and be like, oh, I'm no good at math. and get a D and be like, oh, well, I didn't really work at it. I don't know. It's not a great example to relate. But, you know, no, I know, kind I know of, what you're saying. I know what you're saying. It's kind of that, uh, just act like you don't care. If you're like, I don't care about this. I don't care about ping pong. But in reality, I really do, and it's killing me but, that I'm losing to this guy. <laughs> yeah, it's just, 
insecurity in a sense, uh, a lack of sec- being secure. And and I I had a bunch of issues that came about, um, you know, at home during my during once I was released by Denver. Uh, um, I wanted to retire, actually, um, because my body um, I took a beating in college. And then um, I presented that to my, my mother and my sisters, and they were all four, but my dad didn't take it too well. Um, we kind of had a falling out, a huge falling out blew up on me. Um, and I blew up on him. And then, uh, I really started to heavily drink. And then my situation happened at the beginning of 2016. What's the situation you're talking about? The, uh, my domestic violence charge of 2016. So it was, uh, just this resentment that I had, um, that, which is why I increased my drinking and made a bad decision. (laughs) Where are you at in the process of that? Is that cleared up yet? Or are you still going through the court? No, that's, no, no, that's cleared. That's okay. cleared up. And that's cleared up right now. Um, and once I once I complete uh, probation, which I'm currently on, uh, it'll be expunged. So, okay. Yeah, so it's misdemeanors, um, which I'm not downplaying what I did. But uh, that's why I'm very passionate about speaking about it because those who you know, are addicts, understand how you can act uncharacteristically due to your addiction <clears throat> who was that resentment towards that you you referenced my father so that's part of the reason why the the domestic violence you think that you made poor decisions because you were resentful towards him it was more not because of not because i didn't do what i did because of my father i drank more okay because of my relationship with my father i became more depressed i became more alone because my in my mind I was like, did we start football? Did we have a relationship only because of football? Or mm. you know, and I'm still your son. I'm still the same person. Like, why aren't we? Why aren't you accepting the fact that I want to quit? Not not quit. Want to retire? Mm. <clears throat> um, so it was it was it was hard for me to kind of swallow that pill and deal did, with it. Where are you at right now with your dad? We we actually are recovering. Um, we're, we 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 are re- rebuilding our uh, relationship. And he understands that he made a mistake, and I understand I made mistakes. And, uh, you know, we're kind of putting it behind us and moving forward because, you know, it's a learning process for us both. We're both recovering alcoholics uh, who understand uh, what it takes to stay in recovery. So you have a, a son, I know. Like, how do you, yeah. and it seems like it's very, this is, it. Oops, sorry. It's pretty, it's genetic a lot of times that the gene, the alcoholism or the addiction gene, like, how do you, how can you, I don't know, not drill it into your son's head, but how can you make him aware of this, of, hey, this this is in our family, this is real. Like, How do you present that as he gets older? Yeah, man. Uh, so I, this is where the passion comes from because I told somebody the other day, I actually told the group on Tuesday night, I said, you know, I, I want for my son, I want to, him to be, you know, proud of the accolades and all that stuff, but I want him to be proud to call me his father, you know, by the path that I'm on now, actually fighting something instead of, fighting defenses going against defenses i want him to really pay attention once he's older to how i'm fighting against life what was given to me uh you know from you know my father and so on and and that's really my passion is to kind of explain that to him when he gets older i'm sure he's going to experience with alcohol you know everyone a good amount of people do Mm -hmm. but i just want him to tread lightly yeah, to let him know that's got to be tough when you know yeah. they have that. You, like, hey, there's a high chance you have this gene. It's been oh, yeah. generations. <clears throat> Man, I don't know. What are they? So you're where are you right now in the in the recovery process? I am currently my calendar sitting right over there. So 267 days sober. Wow, congrats, man! How does does it get easier each day, or does it get harder? It's weird. It, it's a little bit of both. It gets easier. But it also gets harder because I know that it's not going to always be easy. <laughs> kind of a sense. Um, right now, it's 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 easy because I I already know I can already see what uh, my sobriety has done for me. Um, my mindset, my relationships um, with my family, and my relationship with my girlfriend and my son has been awesome. Um, so it's it's been it's been great, man. So you're, are you currently living in, in Madison by yourself? Um, I'm right. Actually, I'm actually in Sun Prairie. Yes. In okay. the Sun Prairie area. It's, it's, it's neighboring town of Madison and, uh, I'm going to knock out this degree. I'm only 30 credits short, so 35 to be exact. So it's, 
this summer. So I'll be able to graduate in the spring. Okay. So do you worry about being, uh, being there like near campus on your own? I feel like the alone time when guys are alone, the, the friends I've had that have been, had some addiction issues seem like when they're alone, they, they tend to make poor decisions. No, nah, well, I'm fortunate enough to have my family still here. Okay. My oldest, my oldest sister's even here with my younger sister, my brother-in-law, we go golfing every weekend. So, uh, and both of my parents are here. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, I got family here that I spend a lot of my time with and my girlfriend and my son make trips here most every other weekend. So and vice versa, I'll go out to Denver when I can, but I still have a good group of friends who live around the area. Some are GAs for the Badgers. Um, others, you know, are participating in this program that we're all participating in. So, is Borland in that program? Yeah, he is. Yeah. What's, what is the program exactly? It's just uh, it's a meditation uh, thing that we're all doing, bringing mindfulness into into sport. Um, which you know he he's really passionate about doing that, and I think it does actually help because you know with head trauma comes you know multiple head trauma comes you know anxiety comes all all of the bad stuff. So just meditating and being aware of living in the now kind of helps out. How is your head? What, what, what's your, your concussion history like? My head's good, actually. I just participated in that brain and body study. <clears throat> Flew me out to Cleveland. They did and uh, did scans of the brain and everything, and I'm good. Surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brain, yeah. <laughs> Brain's good, uh, which I'm surprised because I had 996 carries in college. I think Jeez. that's what it is. And especially like you're, a, you're, <laughs> a, you're cut out of the, the cloth of – Wisconsin just straight bruisers. So my freshman year, man, we went there to Wisconsin and played, and it was like I I, I can't even name all the the running backs. First string guy comes in, he's like five nine, two forty, all muscle, like all. And then all of a sudden, the second back, third back, it's like every single guy. I'm like, these dudes are all clones of each other, and they're impossible <laughs> to take down. So that's all. Whenever right. I watch you play there, I'm like, where do they keep getting these guys? Like these yeah. monsters that are so hard to tackle. Yeah, they, they, they go and search and find their exact mold they're looking for. Uh, but everything is good, though, with my brain. And uh, concussion-wise, I had documented four of them, um, which, I mean, there's you, which you understand that there's so much gray with it uh, uh, to where some doctors have to document it for protocol reasons. Um, did you have any nasty ones, like where you puked or had to spend the night in the hospital? No, honestly, no. Um no, none like that. Just a lot of. I had really one bad one uh, during the game, which I didn't know I had it until after the game. I didn't remember the entire second half of the game. I had to go home and watch it uh, to see what happened. Yeah, but uh, fortunate enough that there's no problems that came up. So I wanted to do the study just to get a baseline after yeah. the NFL. So then once, you know, obviously, God forbid, but if anything comes up in the next 20 years, I'll be able to, you know, see how fast it accumulated or whatever. So for that that bad one you said where you forgot the second half, did you just not tell anybody when you got hit or what? Well, I just blacked out. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. honestly, trying to think about it is difficult because I should have told somebody, but I didn't. I wasn't there. It happened, and I was like, I tried so hard to focus on and just get back to playing, uh, to where I lost consciousness anyway i don't want to say that fully but it just i just it was just very difficult for me to remember the second half uh, so did you but like that's then, interesting to me on the hit did you get hit and did you come off the sidelines or what happened you go right back yeah yeah the yeah yeah got hit uh kind of stumbled walked to the sidelines sat down um they did actually test on me i passed all the tests put me back in the game played the rest of the second half um didn't know what happened what went on and kind of, it was during the it was my 2011 season um, against Michigan State when we lost in that Hail Mary, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that Hail Mary with Russell. That I don't remember any of that second half, so I went home and had to watch it. Did you did you come in and tell the trainers or the coaches when you came like a day or two later? I told them the next day. Yeah, uh, I told them the next day, and then you know they did a great job of doing the whole protocol, the seven day thing, and making sure I was good to go. Did you miss any games? Uh no. Dang uh, man, you're you know, trooper. Was, you're a, you're a throwback man. You're young, but you're you're a throwback. Yeah, like, you, a come thing. on. You know how it is. You know how it is in college. It's you, you all. You just got your bell rung. Get back in there. <laughs> <laughs> you just got dinged. Yeah, yeah, man. It's, yeah, uh, not a lot of not a lot of lawsuits that you can come about with in, in college as a 
as you can in the NFL. <laughs> no, nah, and I think in the NFL, man, when I watch it, I, I they have like independent doctors on the sidelines up in the box yeah, now. Up the box, yeah. The problem is though, I there's still there's <clears throat> always going to be an account. The player's going to have to be. It, it's on him ultimately. Mm -hmm. You can play it off where they don't. You can't. You don't show unless you get dinged really bad and you're walking, falling down. Right. You can play it off to where they don't. They're not going to know. You have to kind of self-report if you want to make a difference. Yeah, yeah, and that's the th and that's that's why it's such a catch twenty-two. It's or a double-edged sword in in a sense. Um, you know, because players, you you get it. You don't you don't want to get out and sit out for a game. You you know you want to make an impact. You want to keep your position. Keep Look at job. Alex Smith. Alex Smith and Kaepernick's a prime example. Yes, it is. Actually. Concussion and he lost his gig. Yes, it is. Lost it. Yeah. So it's you want to keep your job. You want to stay in because. You know, for most players, most for most people, most players are uh, expendable. You know, if you're not the Peyton Manning, Tom Brady's. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, man. Uh, I don't, I, man. I don't know how. I don't know how they can do, they especially these independent doctors or people on the sidelines. Yes, they they will. They're trying very hard, but they haven't been out there and they haven't taken. They don't. If you don't know the kind of shots that that are, a lot of times it doesn't look bad when guys get dinged up pretty good. Right. Especially as a running back, I can't imagine it's got to be like the guys coming in late, just hitting you right perfectly in the temple or under the chin or something to where other people would just think it's a normal play. But I, I feel like I can, since I've been in there, you have an eye and you can see like, oh, man, watch this. Watch out, man. This dude's going to be wobbly getting up. Right. It's really the – yeah, it's like as you're going down about six inches from the ground and then that guy just comes in, you know, just dives right on in like the back of your head. Those are the ones it's like, because they're completely unexpected. Oh, no question, man. I'm gonna, I'm going to uh, wrap this thing up shortly. Just have a few more for you. But I, I, in your piece, you said something about when the Broncos won the Super Bowl. Were you in jail that night? Yes, I was. Did you? Could you see the game? Yep, watched it. How the heck? Like, were you in your own set, like in a big open room? What was it? Um, I was in a uh, yeah. It was a kind of uh, big room. There was about eight of us in there. Uh, two, four, six. Yeah, there was, it was, no, there's only six of us, but in a little bitty um, metal table in the middle, obviously the toilet um, connected water fountain in the, right above it was the TV. Uh, people in there knew who I was and it just didn't feel good, man. Watching the team that just released me uh, uh, win the Super Bowl, and then I'm sitting in jail watching it. It was an eye opening experience, but uh, in a good way, and I say eye-opening in, in a great way because, you know, that really changed me. Was that like your bottom? Oh, 100% bottom. I mean, I'm I'm sitting in jail. There's a guy who came in. He was kind of upset that – he was kind of upset with me that I was in jail. <laughs> like, yeah, because he was like, you know, you're supposed to be an idol. You're supposed to be someone we're all looking up to and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm just sitting there just keeping my head down, keeping my mouth shut. And, uh, you know, he's kind of just going off, you know, not in an aggressive way, but he was just saying it. And I just kept watching the game and all that stuff. Uh, just mind him, you know, my own business. But it but it, but it, but it, hurt. It hurt because I was – a bunch of emotions were going through my head. I mean, I obviously had people looking up to me, kids looking up to me, and I made a mistake. Now I'm watching, you know, the team that I grew up idolizing. You know, been a Broncos fan my entire life. Um, win the Super Bowl. Do and they – uh... That that's almost like a scene out of a movie, man. It really is. Really, like, yeah. You can go back and you you can actually date it. Um, they won the Super Bowl February seventh. I was arrested February fifth, Friday night. So I had to stay in jail through the weekend till Monday. Wow. To see a judge. Mm. That happened to a teammate of mine, and he got arrested over Thanksgiving break on like Thursday night. And a judge oh, wasn't coming until Monday, but just so he had to stay until Monday. And if it was a normal a normal day, he would have been out like that night. Right. Or something. I'm telling you, man, those days were the worst days of my life because you literally have nothing to do. And except not having nothing to do, there's no access to the outside world except a pay phone. It's Ooh. like, but it's, there's only so much you can say on that phone because mm -hmm. they're listening and all that stuff. So, and it's timed and all that stuff. So it's just the lack of access to the outside world, what's going on. You can't see, there's no windows, there's no nothing. And then just that feeling of shame, guilt. Uh, it, it, it wasn't good, but it's it's been one heck of a learning process that I'm willing to share because just like you said, no one wants to listen to the old cookie cutter, the guy who 
who's actually fortunate enough to not make any mistakes, but people are more related. They can relate more to those who have made a few mistakes because um, addiction is, if you, if you're an addict, you're going to make mistakes. <laughs> That's inevitable. No question. Do you think that that night in jail that, or that time you spent in jail, was that necessary for you to wake you up, to get you going in the right direction? Um, hundred percent. But here's the thing is I was then arrested again in whitewater. Um, Wisconsin for drinking. Uh, my addiction took over uh, because throughout that entire time and all that was going on. Um, so the girl, the girl I'm with now is not the girl with the situation I happened with. Uh, I actually had a great relationship with her out in Denver. I met her in 2014. And then when I was released, we kind of split ways and I met someone else. Um, so as I was arrested and once I got out, I got out February 8th or whatever. Um, four days later, I get a text from her telling me, that she's six months pregnant. And I'm like, you know, why didn't you tell me sooner? Uh, you actually helped me pack up my place in Denver and didn't tell me. <laughs> um, but she had her own stuff going on. So I had that going on. I had six weeks to prepare for my child who was born April 2nd. And then a week after that, I went and drank in Whitewater because I just couldn't. It was just a lot of pressure, man. I woke, you know, went to sleep, not a father, woke up a father. And... That was just a lot of pressure on its own too, but it, um, it's, it's a blessing. Though. It really is. Would you say two hundred and sixty some days now? Is it two sixty six, two sixty seven? I got a two sixty six. Do you like X off? Do you like have a counter? Do you literally like put X's through or what? Let me show you. That's, yeah. For the audio <laughs> listeners, we're gonna, he's going to check us out. I'll tell you. Oh yeah, you got a calendar with X's through. Oh, and your lines. You you have the day. Wow, each day, two, two, 264, 265, 266. And then once you finish that day, you X that out? Yeah. That's awesome. Is that almost like, uh, that's just like a visual reminder to keep you accountable? That's what it is, man. That's what it is. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like the little notes that you put on your locker. <laughs> yeah. You know, the pictures, the notes, like the pictures of who you're doing it for and all that stuff. And that's, I'm being sober for myself and also for my son because I, I make sure to tell people that I'm, you know, I have to do it for myself because yeah. if I do it for myself, obviously that's going to, in a positive way, impact my son's life. Is it tough? Final, final one for me. Is it, is it tough to not, um, or how do you handle with that addiction? Mm -hmm. It comes di addiction to a lot of different things. I know a lot of people can shift. They try to yep. go to positive things. Have, has it come? Like, are you drinking like forty <laughs> cans of Coke a day? I've heard people do it's, that. The thing is, it's coffee, man. It's, yeah. And I, yeah. You, sp you smoking yeah. cigs too? Like the guys yeah. outside of rehab drinking coffee, <laughs> smoking cigs all day? No, no, my asthma won't let me do that. <laughs> uh, but um, it's coffee, man. It really is coffee. Staying busy. I make sure to stay busy because. Um, you know, transitioning into the the real world, it's uh, it's less less traffic than the uh, than the NFL and the sports world. So I make sure to keep myself busy, just so I keep my mind on tasks and drink a lot of coffee and uh, do a lot of traveling. You know, my son's been consuming a lot of my time, so it, we just actually left uh, uh, Hollywood Studios uh, two weekends ago. Really? So, okay. Yeah. Nice man. All right, well, Monte Ball, I appreciate you coming on here, being honest. It's it's been uh, it's obviously fun watching you play, but I think it's cool your what you're venturing into now. So I really, really appreciate you. Where would you want people to find you if they want to go check you out on online or, or find one of your speaking gigs? Yeah, I, I my my website's gonna launch tomorrow, actually. Yeah, um, so once my website launches, um, I'll actually send you the link. Yeah, we'll put I'm it up. Really what's the name gonna be, or what's like the URL? Um, well, I, I'm not going to say that now because it's still under the works. So you gotcha. can actually you can actually jump on and look at the site now, uh, the domain name. But uh, I don't want people to do that yet. So <laughs> right. What I'm gonna, right. So what I'm going to do is it's, I'm, it's coming out tomorrow. So I'm going to shoot you the link um, if that's okay with you. And I'll yeah. Really hey, good news. Know. Good news for you, Monte. This isn't going to be posted for probably five five or six days, so you could say it now. Cool. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, awesome, man. So what it is? It's uh, it's it's uh, MonteLBall.com. Okay, we'll we'll That's link good. to it underneath this this episode too on YouTube and on uh, on the iTunes feed Sweet. as well. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So right now it's still under the works, uh, but it's gonna be it's gonna be good. It's gonna show all that I'm doing. I do a lot of volunteer work. Just to, giving back is very therapeutic for myself um, because all in all, I'm still fortunate. 
um, compared to a lot of others. So I make sure to keep reminding myself that by giving back and, and just being thankful for the process, catching my addiction at a young age, 26 years old. So Awesome, man. Well, Monte, really appreciate it. We'll, we'll link everything up for you. And, yeah, uh, thank you. We'll talk to you down the road, man. I really appreciate it, man. And uh, uh, as a, I grew up a Broncos fan, but man, I loved watching you play. And that's, I'm being 100% honest. Uh, you know, obviously go four years here in college. And everyone loved you. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I love, love Camp Randall. That's my, <laughs> other than Ohio State, is my favorite place to play. All you crazy people, man. You're the best. <laughs> You're the best. All right. All right, man. Thanks, Monte. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, man. All right. See you. We're glad you could join us for today's conversation. After you subscribe to the show, head over to thehawkcast.com or reach out to AJ directly on Twitter at OfficialAJHawk to recommend future guests that will help us inspire people to keep talking. Thanks again, and we look forward to speaking with you next time on The Hawkcast.